Uh, welcome back to the Ash Museum of Science Summer of Science series. All summer long, we'll be finding experts and local science partners to help us serve our mission of providing quality STEM education across Western North Carolina. Today with me, I have Neil Piper, uh, the director at the Margaret C. Woodson Planetarium in Salisbury, North Carolina, and I'm Isabella Field, and I'm an intern at the Ash Museum of Science. So, uh, Neil, tell us about yourself. Uh, what got you interested in the field of astronomy, um, and how did you get involved in your work at the planetarium? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, this is uh, it's just fun to actually see a high schooler's face because that is my job. I'm a teacher. And so uh, to actually see a high schooler and go, hey, uh, is much better than the adults that I normally have to work with now remotely. Uh, yeah. But uh, me as an astronomer or actually as a planetarium director, as a science educator, the first time I ever walked into a planetarium was when I got the job. I know that's insane. I know I didn't go to a planetarium when I was a kid. Um, I actually applied for the job here at Horizons and at the planetarium as a longtime STEM educator. So I was, uh, so I was able to uh, apply for the job and say, I love science. I love space science. I taught um, AP environmental science and earth science for a long time. So that's uh, it. And so they hired me and then I said, well, what's my classroom going to be like? And it's amazing. It's awesome. <laughs> it's like a high ceiling, you know, 360 dome experience. Yes. And so I was able to do a lot of upgrades myself and, and now it's, it's my classroom. And so uh, when we didn't have the Rona, when we had no Rona, then <laughs> it was, uh, then I saw about 32,000 students in my, uh, in my planetarium. So Awesome. Uh, I will, this year in 2020, we're not going to say the number that I've seen, but it's quite a bit less than that. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. I mean, with the way everything is now, yeah. I'm sure that's effective, but that's still, that's really awesome. So what kind of, like, I'm sure you cover all range of topics at the planetarium, but like, give us an overview, like, what is your typical, like, what do you typically teach students at this planetarium? So when, uh, when the lights go out, the, the awesome happens because we have a projector that has a realistic night sky. So it doesn't matter what the, the, um, the, the weather is, uh, when the lights go off, you see uh, it, it looks like you're outside and the stars are twinkling. Uh, so we almost start every show with what's going on right now uh, in astronomy because the cool part about astronomy is not what happened yesterday, but what's gonna happen tomorrow. It's kind of like the weather. No one cares about yesterday's weather. So we talk about what's going to happen. And so right now we'd be talking about the Perseid meteor shower yes. because that's what's happening kind of right now. And some of the manned missions that are going on, um, you, know, uh, you know, we've got a, a rover headed to Mars. We've got mm -hmm. all these cool things going on. So uh, in space science, it's always about what happens tomorrow, but uh, I get to do other curriculum too. So I get to talk about the bottom of the ocean and we can like pretend like we're at the bottom of the ocean in my, in my planetarium or flying with dinosaurs or doing whatever. So it's yeah. a pretty cool experience when you come into the, it's like, I describe it as a VR experience for a whole crowd. Yeah. So like a crowdsource VR. So. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And I'm sure that that whole experience is a really good like way to educate people and like kids or like, you know, even high school kids. It's really exciting, you know, get to go into a planetarium and all that. So I'm sure it's a really awesome way to teach for sure. Definitely. Yeah. It, it definitely we we get paid in oohs and ahs. That's what I, <laughs> that's what I yes. So the more that yes. you ooh and ah, then I'm like, yep, gotcha. Yes. And uh, the older students, like, uh, you know, upper high school students, wh which I did get to teach this past co uh, couple of years, I've been teaching an AP class, in addition to my duties as a planetarium director. Mm -hmm. And so I bring my students down there. And I think the older uh, students even love it as much as the kids did. Uh, they were just like, we get to have class in the planetarium today. I'm like, yep, that's the bonus of being <laughs> in yeah. this class. So uh, yeah. they enjoyed it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So since you do work in the planetarium, you deal with astronomy a lot. Uh, there's a lot of branches of astronomy. So which one is your favorite? There's many and it's hard to pick one. I love astronomy. Yeah, it too. is. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it, it, I wish I was a research astronomer. I've, I've been to the top of Mauna Kea, seen all the cool telescopes that are going on right now. I have to say, though, that I'm a sucker for planets. I, I'm planetary science. Uh, you know, 
if you do this, if you're in this business and you don't think it would be cool to find life on another planet or talk about that, like, you know, little aliens or anything like that, it yeah. seems like you would, uh, it's almost like a science fiction thing, but I think that in, we're seeing in this generation that it's not science fiction. We're finding water all over our solar system. Uh, at the bottom of every crater in the moon, we're finding water. So uh, eventually the, the discovery of life on another planet is gonna happen. And I'm super excited that we can see that happening in the next, I, I think in the next few years, maybe even the next decade. Yeah, for sure. That is awesome. All right, we're going to take a quick break here from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. The Amos Summer of Science series is brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher is the world leader in serving science. Their mission is to enable customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. Thermo Fisher Scientific, step up, step beyond. More information at thermofisher.com. And Hedrick Industries, standing for quality and commitment to service. HedrickIND.com. The Duke Energy Foundation, committed to making strategic investments to build powerful communities where nature and wildlife thrive, students can excel, and a talented workforce drives economic prosperity for all. Duke-Energy.com. And Baker Grading and Landscaping, changing the landscape while keeping with nature's flow. BakerGrading.com. Lancaster Law Firm, real estate attorneys for realtors, lenders, and homeowners. LancasterLawFirm.com. Holston Gases, your independent supplier of industrial, medical, propane, and beverage gases. HolstonGases.com. And member and donor support from people like you. All right, welcome back to Summer of Science. Uh, let's continue to hear from our scientist here, Neil Fife. All right. Uh, next question here, let's see. Um, per, so you mentioned earlier the Perseid meteor shower, um, and I know Planetarium, you're honestly the, obviously getting to look at that and you know learn a lot about that. So can you tell us a little bit about what that will be like, how we can see it and all that? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, one of the misconceptions, that's what I kind of deal in, is uh, how big is a meteor? And a lot of uh, a lot of students and even public, if you said, okay, well, you see this giant streak of light going across the sky, it may even look like a fireball occasionally, maybe once in a month, you would get to see something that looks really big. You would think that like a whole car is coming through our atmosphere, but it's actually really small. It's the size of a grain of sand. And so that's probably the first misconception is that uh, this, uh, that the meteor shower is dangerous. Like, you know, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be attacked by asteroids <laughs> or anything. Like that. That's not true. Um, so that's the first misconception. And the second is that if you go outside for a meteor shower, you're going to see like thousands of meteors, you know, in a night. And that's not true either. Almost every night you're, if you stay out long enough, you're going to see a meteor. Uh, you're going to see a streak of light. Uh, but that, during the meteor shower, we're just going through a tail of a comet, uh, or um, in, th in this case, it's a fairly large comet that passed through our Earth's uh, orbit. And so you're going to get a couple hundred, possibly an hour, which would mean about two per minute or three per minute. And that's, that's a lot. That in is a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. And you have to be in a dark spot. spot. So in Rowan County, where I teach, uh, that would mean going towards, uh, from Salisbury, kind of headed towards Mooresville along Highway 70. Uh, that's the darkest part of our county. And so it's only about 15 minutes from the center of town. And you're in a fairly dark area. Uh, for y'all in Asheville, you have a great place you can get up on the parkway and look. So that's uh, as long as they don't close the park on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so, the most part, I think it's open. So Yeah. So, and the best time to look at a uh, meteor shower is actually just a couple, as soon as the sun sets, wait about 45 minutes and that's a good spot or go out uh, about an hour before, uh, before sunrise. And gotcha. you'll see, and that's actually a really cool time to see the International Space Station too. Uh, yeah. In the next couple of weeks, uh, we have... The space station near Asheville is going to be uh, overhead and in Salisbury too. It's going to be always in the morning. So you have to get up early, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you, so I know 
do this is just like you sort of just wondering do like scientists at nasa and all that even though appreciate is obviously a very reoccurring and like predictable meteor shower but do they still research it study it like you know take a look at it like what is there to learn from it from yeah there's uh i mean if uh we get meteorites if it hits the planet uh then that's when uh the scientists go crazy um and they actually just got done with a, a survey scan of antarctica trying to look for uh, meteorites. Cause obviously in the snow, if you see anything dark, it's probably not a rock that someone threw on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's really easy to see. And actually uh, even uh, if you, if you want to delve into this part of astronomy of, of finding sort of uh, things that have come through our atmosphere, uh, you can do, you can find micrometeorites. Uh, there's some good YouTube videos on that. Uh, just finding micrometeorites, you'll you'll find one if you look. Uh, and so e anywhere on the planet, um, you you can you can find a meteorite. Uh, it may only be this big, <laughs> but it, that's still pretty cool to think that it came from some part of the solar system. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So when scientists study those meteorites, what are they like gathering? Like what what? Why do they all get excited about meteorites? Nope. Oh, they, uh, that's, uh, that's a really good question. They, uh, it's all about composition. Uh, so to get through our atmosphere, it, it needs to be made of, uh, you know, certain elements. So it's either going to be nickel iron or it's going to be carbon. Everything else is just going to burn up in the atmosphere. So it's all about ratios. And honestly, if you um, were to discover one that had an odd ratio, uh, you know, we're always looking for the oddballs in science. Like we have yeah. all this expected data and then we have this really cool oddball. Uh, that's what we're looking for uh, because then that can indicate that the meteorite came from, you know, the outer part of our solar system, maybe another solar system. And so that's the kind of data that we're really excited about. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. All right, we're going to take another quick break, hear from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Thank you for tuning in to the Amos Summer of Science series. I'm Rachel Sparks, board president for the Asheville Museum of Science. We're excited to share this series with friends and supporters. During the pandemic, it's important that we use digital technology to continue the mission of Amos to spark curiosity and a lifelong love of learning. Amos has shared online programs like our daily doses of science and Ask the Scientists over 115,000 times with over 3,000 science explorers during quarantine. The Summer of Science series We'll share important science curriculum, and I encourage your support of our programs. Temporarily closing the museum has had a significant impact on our services and our finances. So I'm asking for your support with a donation of $40. That can sponsor 25 online engagements in STEM learning. Some can give more and some less, and any amount you can give will be very helpful. Please go online to ashevillescience.org slash support dash us or text the number on your screen to donate thank you so much welcome back to summer science series uh earlier we were talking about perseid meteor shower how we can see it and why meteorites are important uh so i'm going to ask you another question about you know things we can see in the sky you also mentioned uh the international space station and getting to see that so you said early morning would be the best time to see that? It is. Uh, you know, starting the 21st through the 27th, it's either once or um, on the 26th, it's twice. You can actually see it. So what I do is I actually, uh, the, if you're interested in astronomy, there's amazing apps out there. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to plug any particular <laughs> one, but if you just look up International Space Station, there's a couple of trackers and they'll just uh, notify your phone. Uh, if you just let the notifications happen, it'll say it's over your head. And it happened one time when I was at dinner uh, with some friends. It, it just notified me that I could go outside and watch the International Space Station. We had just finished dinner. I said, do you want to go outside and see the International Space Station? They're like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and so we, we did not dine and dash. We just, just went outside, looked at the space station. It takes about three minutes uh, to get all the way across the sky. Um, and again, the best time to look at it is just after... A sunrise, a sunset, or just before sunrise because uh, the reflected light. And it's definitely gotten brighter over the years, uh, 25 years. Uh, it used to be just a tiny little space station, and now I call it a trailer park. It's got yeah. lots of modules and uh, big, uh, you know, um, solar arrays. And mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, and having SpaceX just go there, having Bob and Doug, if, if you watch them come back to Earth. Yes. Uh, I think everybody, they, this is really cool because the anybody your age and younger, this was the first uh, uh, astronauts you've seen go up from America to back to America um, because before that it was the uh, space shuttle and it's been, uh, you know, 16, almost, eight, I, I can't remember if it's 16 or 18 years, but you know, that's a whole generation of kids that haven't seen astronauts. And now we know Bob and Doug. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That was a super cool thing to watch is watching them go up. I, I didn't watch them go down, but I did watch them yeah. go up. And that was definitely super, super cool to yeah. watch. So yeah. I think everybody was counting down, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> I think we all were. We're like, no, no, no. Yeah. We were on like the early program watching it like 45 minutes before like they were doing anything. It was like, yeah. Yeah, it exactly. Get up and, and it was so sad when they delayed, but I, mm -hmm. everybody was asking me if they were going to delay the flight and I'm like, yeah, but they're not going to tell us until closer. <laughs> yeah. Bad weather. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's, that's how they tend to do things, but yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, next question. This is kind of a, a big one. So we can go on a nice little tangent with this. Um, you mentioned the Mars rover and also just like future Mars missions. We know SpaceX is kind of thinking about that. We know NASA's thinking about that. Everyone's thinking about going to Mars. So um, being a professional in the astronomy field, what is your take on all of that and the revolutions coming from it? Yeah. And, and China. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, not just uh, not just SpaceX or not just Virgin Atlantic, not, um, yeah, the, it's kind of a, the new space race, I guess. Um, yeah. NASA has a big leg up. They've been mm -hmm. going since the 70s, so um, they get a little bit of a head start. But uh, the other entities that are going to Mars, I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I'm excited every single time something is launched to Mars. We think it's really simple. Uh, there's only a, a, you know, the way the launch window works, and I'll probably uh, send you the animation for mm -hmm. what I'm, what I'm talking about right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's only a launch window uh, twice in 26 months because you have to catch up to the planet, or the planet has to catch up to us, right? Yeah. So there's there's like a, a a fairly small launch window. So in this last launch window, we had NASA, the Mars 2020 ro rover. And then China launched their, their sort of unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is exciting because uh, there's very few things that bring, like the Olympics, bring everybody together. Uh, but if we were to land someone on Mars, uh, that would, I think, bring the whole planet together. And, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it'll be an American. That's, uh, that's I know that's, it, it, it's exciting, but it's also kind of nerve wracking because you're like, I want it to be an American. <laughs> yes, that patriotic so, spirit. So, uh, and and preferably on my end, I would want it to be an American woman. Like we don't yeah. we're done sending the guys up. You know, we all <laughs> sent them to the moon. We can yes. we can let the women land on Mars. Uh, so that's uh, I mean that's it. It's exciting. It's also an opportunity for innovation. Uh, we 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 need a lot of things to go right for us to be able to land on Mars. We have to be able to take water and break it into hydrogen and oxygen. We have to uh, have the building materials on the planet to be able to help us build the big enough structures for us to live there for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. We're gonna have to have some kind of emergency system, you know, to kind of get them off the planet. So it's gonna be a lot of innovation. I, and I'm excited because it seems like both, um, you, you know, everyone is excited about Mars and the more we do it, the better it'll be. Um, can maybe you could tell us about some of the other things that make going to Mars so much different than going to the moon besides just distance because yeah, there's a distance lot. And also uh, it, 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 when you get a, all right, so I like to describe it as a, a golf shot. You know, if you, if you putt, you know, it, it, you can make that shot, you know, and if it's only a five foot putt, you start getting a 60 foot putt, you know, if you get it close, you're happy. Well, yeah. with, with space travel, close isn't good enough. You have oh, to get yeah. it in. And so, uh, so like going to Mars is almost like a, a hole in one. So the math gets really tough. Um, you know, when you start extrapolating out, a, a tiny mistake can make a big difference. And uh, we saw it with a couple of the other early rovers where we would 
try to land and it would bounce off the atmosphere, even though Mars atmosphere is very thin. And, it, and that's actually a problem in itself because having a thick atmosphere is, you know, you get a lot of wind, a lot of force that can kind of wreak havoc on your lander. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have any atmosphere, like parachutes don't work. Yeah. So, so that's, you know, when you look at the movie, The Martian, uh, they yes. ask the, uh, yeah, they, I mean, we love Matt Damon, right? He's doing yeah. great. But <laughs> if you ever read the book, the, the biggest lie is the very first scene that uh, a, a windstorm comes up and punctures the suit, right? That's the first mm -hmm. scene. Yeah. Well, that wouldn't happen on Mars. They don't have wind. Uh, it, force yeah. enough to puncture a suit, that's not going to happen. Now, mm -hmm. they could have something fall on them or, or do something like that. But uh, so, you know, not having the atmosphere is going to be a big challenge. Yeah. And creating, I mean, it's just like going scuba diving. You know, you, you've got to create your own atmosphere. So all of those problems are, I'm super glad that way smarter people and younger people <laughs> like you are working on those problems because if it was me, it would just be like, you know, <laughs> shoot a rocket. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. great. Yeah, I know. I feel like that's the, that's the perception sometimes. And I'm like, really, they need a little more complicated no. than that. <laughs> but yeah. No red sure. chemists or rocket ears in here. <laughs> like they're, <laughs> they're not like, hey, y'all look at this. Like they yeah. know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then another question that I've just kind of always had uh, has been in the like in the field of astronomy. I know sometimes like when you take the class in middle school, it's a lot of just like learning about the planets and stuff. But how much math is really involved in all of this space travel? Because I get the feeling it's quite a lot. Yeah, it is. Um, and I love um, there's a, there's a couple of cool channels. Um, uh, Diana is physics girl. She's great. She explains a lot of high level stuff in a way that kids can understand. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's one new one, it's called Five Levels of Physics. And they take it like concepts like gravity and they'll take it from the you know young elementary level. And then they'll explain it again to a middle elementary, a middle schooler, a high schooler, a college mm -hmm. student, and then an expert in the field. And so they'll take something simple like gravity. We know, you know mm -hmm. when something drops, it, you know, it falls at a certain rate here on earth. So something simple like gravity, it becomes cr incredibly complex when you get to an expert level. So mm -hmm. I, I think of it as, uh, you know, it's as much math as you want it to be. Mm. Yeah. In, in astronomy, you can, you can say something and it be accurate to a point. And then, uh, you know, then an a expert in the field will come and go, nope, that's not right. Yeah. <laughs> and here's the math that shows you why you're wrong. And, yeah. And they'll and they'll go all Sheldon on you. So I uh, so I enjoy the fact that I get to do it as a K twelve teacher. I get to kind of spark excitement, and I don't have to uh, go rah, 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 about yeah. The a lot. Go to the quantum physics. Exactly. Of Here yeah. we're going to talk about uh, spin rates and and yeah. derive <laughs> these equations just for fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I very much relate to that. When I was in. Um, for, I think it was my freshman year, I did a science project on resonance of, uh, with Saturn's moons and its rings. Um, and I, I got in a little bit over my head at one, eventually <laughs> because I was like looking at these research papers with just pages and pages of like Le four, like level four calculus I had no clue what was going on I was like this is a really cool topic and I love talking about resonance in the rings I thought it was really cool and like you know the way like the moon's like big little space in the rings I just I thought it was really cool but oh my goodness there was a lot that was beyond my understanding but it was still really cool to just like learn about it and see like how how far that whole topic could go so and I feel like that's where planetarium directors uh we we make a lot of our uh that's what we're able to do uh communication in science is a big deal we see it today like you know we're, we have a global science project and having very you know epidemiologists that are able to communicate to non-scientists in a very simple way is a talent and it's something that i think that our community our scientific community especially space scientists astronomers uh, it's kind of lacking because we we feel like that if you're not able to express yourself in a very technical way and be 100% correct, then uh, there's some kind of less than uh, mm -hmm. in in our field. And so I I 
I'm, there's a lot of people that are working on communication. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think SpaceX has kind of done that for our field is because they know the only way they're going to get investment from other people is if they're able to explain to people who don't know about space travel, how cool it is, the math, and, mm -hmm. you know, there is risk involved. And, yeah. and so I think that's, that's what we uh, love to do. That's what I love to do as a STEM educator, as a scientist. I love to spark interest. Mm -hmm. And I've just been very proud over my 23-year career to have some really high-level scientists that, that still come back and talk to me. And yeah. I go, I appreciate you trying to dumb it down for your science <laughs> teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. yes. so I, I love that. That is one of my uh, proudest things that, that they sat in my, you know, seventh or ninth or 11th grade science class. And now they're professional scientists and mm -hmm. are experts in their field. And I go, you can't talk to me anymore <laughs> about your stuff. You have to be like, oh, I'll dumb it down for Mr. Pfeiffer. Yes. <laughs> yes, for sure. But I, I definitely agree. I think that's a big thing, especially for like sparking like excitement in younger kids because a lot of times if you're like oh my goodness astronomy is just a bunch of physics math on how the rocket's gonna land and all that it can scare kids away and they're like oh, i don't want to do all that math but like if you explain it in a way that's simple understandable especially with a planetarium because those things are awesome then it makes people a lot more excited about the field and they're a lot more interested and then eventually you get a young astronomer who grows up to be an expert in their field. So exactly. I definitely think, yeah, I definitely think that's, that's a really cool point. So sure. yeah, take lots of science and astronomy is amazing in mm -hmm. the uh, virtual world because it's all virtual. We don't get to go to space. We have to take pictures of it. And so astronomy picture of the day, nasa.gov, all those places are really great resources uh, for folks that are, uh, you know, quote, stuck virtual or homeschooled or, or doing things virtually, you can learn a lot, uh, you know, it, going to the actual uh, sites of the science uh, where it's mm -hmm. going on. Yes, yeah, for sure, for sure, definitely. I love following NASA's Instagram too. They have yep. a little- Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. NASA's Instagram is, uh, and, and APOD, I think, uh, Astronomy Picture of the Day has an Insta too. Um, and then uh, I don't think any of them have TikToks yet, although that is coming. <laughs> It's coming. it's coming. There's going to be, there's going to be, a, 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 there's going to be a, 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 like people dancing, you oh, know, yes. in space. <laughs> there definitely will be. Oh my goodness. Very exciting. Hopefully TikTok doesn't get banned before that happens. Exactly. Yeah. That's what we're everybody was worried about. All my students were like, no, yeah, don't I was like, <laughs> only four hours a day given back to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I don't have TikTok, but a lot of my friends do, and oh, the yeah. amount of time on that app is insane. So. Yeah, exactly. You can go down a rabbit hole. So. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions I have. Is there anything else that you want to specifically want to speak on or parting words of wisdom? Well, uh, go to your local planetarium. In Asheville, you have uh, three uh, ones that are fairly local and a brand new one about to open. It's uh, Mayland Community College is out that way and they're getting a brand new planetarium. So go check them out. I'll give them a shout out. And then uh, of course, uh, at, at um, Asheville Museum of Science and, and even just about an hour away, you've got about five planetariums. So go check one out, especially when we go back to phase three, because uh, that's when we'll all be able to open back up to the public. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, go yeah. check it out. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was awesome getting to talk yeah. to you. So much it was great. It was super cool. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.